I come from a small community in Illinois called Kinky Key, about 40 miles south of Chicago. I'm Rob Johnson. I'm district attorney from Alamance County. There's several district attorneys here today. Capital punishment to me was something that was it was there, it was in the abstract, it was out there, I knew about it, and I didn't pay much attention to it. We are here to express our opposition to this bill. Uh, when I did think about capital punishment, it was because of a very notorious crime, and I wanted the police to find him, to convict him, to lock him up, and throw away the key. And if it was bad enough, I wanted him to get the chair. We thought that was all the better. It is certainly uh, something the public wants. By and large, the public wants a death penalty, and I think that uh, we as legislators should ensure that they have one if, in fact, that's the consensus of the, of the North Carolina public. But unfortunately, at least in Illinois, that system doesn't always get it right. The question that I think uh, we need to ask ourselves is, is the system broken or is the system working? The death penalty should be reserved for those very extremely heinous crimes, crimes of uh, murder against uh, law enforcement or murder against a prison guard or, or a murder rape. There's many circumstances the, in which the death penalty applies. We're picking certain people out, not quite at random, uh, but, but not certainly systematically either. It's not always the worst cases that get death. Very often what will happen is the, uh, there will be three people involved in a homicide and those that are the quickest to make a deal with the prosecutor to turn state's evidence, to give testimony, will come up with a 20-year sentence or a 10-year sentence, even if they're the most responsible for the death. And the defendant who's left uh, last to speak to the prosecutor is the one who goes to death row. Uh, what may be a capital offense in one county wouldn't be a capital offense in another simply because the prosecutor doesn't choose to prosecute it that way, no matter if the crimes are the same. So it's, it was, it's, it's become clear, I think, to, to those of us who've studied uh, this system that other things are operating in the courtroom with regard to this life or death, very subjective decision. Nobody believes that guilty people should go unpunished. It just doesn't seem to us that you should have uh, a penalty that's almost whimsically applied. Of course we feel moral outrage at the death of innocent people. Who does not feel moral outrage over the death of innocent people? And we need to feel it. Now it is interesting in our society, we sure seem to feel more outrage over the death of some people than over the death of other people. Using Dr. David Baldus's research, Professor Jack Boger argued a landmark case before the U.S. Supreme Court in 1987 which challenged the constitutionality of a racially discriminatory death penalty system. Baldus found that race played a significant role in death penalty sentencing in Georgia, but not in all cases. When a murder involved especially high or low levels of aggravating circumstances, the outcome was more straightforward, and race didn't play a significant role. But in cases that were moderately aggravated, where a person who supported the death penalty could say, yeah, I could see that this might be a capital case, but maybe not, depending on the mitigating factors. In those cases, race played a, an important role. So that if you had two defendants, one of whom had a prior capital felony, and the other of whom had killed a white victim, they were equally likely to receive a death sentence for those factors alone. These findings were corroborated in a more recent study of North Carolina homicide cases from 1993 through 97. What we found was unmistakable evidence that race continues to play a part in capital sentencing in North Carolina. Very much as Professor Baldus found that uh, racial discrimination enters in based upon the race of the homicide victim. If the victim is white, the odds are significantly higher three to four times as high that a death sentence will be imposed as if the victim is not white. It is not that they get up every morning and say, oh, I'm going to go discriminate against an Indian or a black. 
It's just a subconscious way that society works. And we're all guilty of that. We're all guilty of it. And the death penalty is no different. And so when a white doctor is killed, when a uh, white sales clerk is shot at a 7-Eleven, the community response and the prosecutor's response says, I'm not going to deal down to a lesser offense. I'm going to stay here on the weekend and gather the evidence and put this case before a jury and demand a death sentence. When the defendant is black and the victim is black, on the other hand, there's this sense, oh well, it's the killing among black folk. And uh, we certainly don't approve of it, but we're not going to work especially hard to make this the case that we hold up as the symbol of, of our anger. Prosecutors are aware that overall, whites support the death penalty more than minorities. And there, I think the prosecutors are more self-conscious, sometimes racially, uh, than, than jurors themselves, uh, selecting juries that they think will be more likely to return the, the verdicts they, they, they want. Don't isolate that because race, over the years, has been a factor in the issuing of traffic tickets. It's been an issue in who gets served in restaurants first. So it's a little microcosm of society, and that's all it is. Interestingly, when we got to the Federal Court of Appeals, one of the judges actually said during the oral argument, Mr. Boger, we know there's racial discrimination in the death penalty, but th what do you expect us to do about it? What can be done about something like that? The truth is it's racial discrimination. You've got to eliminate it. So that's what we brought. Justice Powell rejected it and said, in effect, this is an attack not simply on Georgia's death sentencing system. It's an attack on the criminal justice system as well, because if it's true about the death penalty, it may be true about other uh, lesser crimes. Now, the, the, the dissenters, Justice Brennan, said uh, that's a remarkable statement. If there's race discrimination more broadly in the criminal justice system, there are two things one can do. One can either sweep it under the rug and say we're not going to think about it, or one can actually begin to address those disparities as well. The death penalty is not just a symbolic statement about our anger about crime, because I share that anger about violent crime. It is literally taking certain lives and extinguishing them. Uh, in order to express that social outrage. If a white person is killed, send them to death. If a black person is killed, well, it's too bad. Give them a life sentence, give them 20 years, and let's go on about our business. I think we need to look closely to see whether that's what we're doing. Because if, if it is, it's only a step or two less heinous than, than executing the innocent. If it's true, but the only way you can have capital punishment is to have racially discriminatory capital punishment, then I think society owes itself a serious discussion about whether it ought to carry out the death penalty under those circumstances. But nobody who's in favor of the death penalty wants to execute someone who's innocent. I can understand maybe making a mistake once, maybe even twice, but 13 times, that, that's something wrong. Some were saved not by judicial review, but by 20-year-old journalism students. Four men were convicted of murdering a man and a woman in a poor south suburban Chicago community called Ford Heights for a 1978 double murder. A fellow by the name of Reneal Jimerson and Dennis Williams were sentenced to death. In the primary testimony, came from a 17-year-old woman who was their alleged accomplice. Questions were raised about her mental competency. She changed her story twice. And because of her cooperation, she received a 50-year sentence in prison. So just on those facts alone, I have to ask you, where's the justice? I didn't see it there. Northwestern journalism students helped poke holes in the case against the Ford Ice Four. They found leads were provided to investigators in the days after the murders that implicated the real killers. But instead, they relied on the false testimony of a mentally challenged 17-year-old. The 
idea is that the only way you can protect innocent people is to treat every person who is brought uh, into a court as if the person is innocent. And what that means is that then everybody will, will handle the case in a way that you would handle it if in fact this person possibly is innocent. I think what's happened with our system is that we're not motivated by that. And, and instead now we assume that we have the right person when the person is picked up and charged with a crime. Uh, the police stop the investigation, prosecutors start to ignore evidence to the, that, that points to innocence, uh, defense lawyers you know, uh, kind of give up, uh, and uh, the whole system now uh, is, is, is actually being undermined because we are not rigorous uh, in, uh, in, in approaching it the way the system is designed to be approached. Um, most of these people are not innocent. Most of the people on death row are not innocent. Most of the people who are charged with crimes are not innocent. But we know that some of them are. And the problem is we can't separate them out in advance. You know, juries have convicted people who were innocent of heinous crimes, sentenced them to death. Judges have reviewed it and they've remained on death row. And a lot of them have gotten off of death row only because of chance. Journalism students, you know, investigating the case because a judge stays it for some reason, giving them an opportunity to investigate it. Uh, these are not courts that are discovering innocent people. Uh, innocent people are being discovered notwithstanding the courts. Uh, and that ought to concern people. All of us are finding that there are cases of people uh, whom we believe are innocent uh, who are in prison. What that means is that the system is not functioning. And I think that uh, what we have to do is to figure out why not. In 1984, I was a 22-year-old college student, 4.0 GPA. And I really wanted to do something with my life. One night, someone broke into my apartment, put a knife to my throat, and he raped me. During the ordeal, I studied every single detail on his face. I made sure that I looked at his hairline, scars, for any tattoos, for any jewelry, for anything that would help me to identify this man, because I was confident that when and if I got out, should I be allowed to see the next day, that I was going to make sure he was put in prison and he was going to rot. I mean, I really was paying attention. So I went to the police station. I looked through hundreds of noses and eyes and eyebrows and hairlines and nostrils and lips, and I put together a composite drawing. Several days later, I did a photo lineup, and I identified my attacker, and I knew who he was. I, I was confident. I was so sure. Several days later, I did a physical lineup, and I picked him out. Same man, photo lineup. I picked him out, and it was him. I knew it. I had picked the right guy, and he was going to go to jail, and he was going to rot there. And if there was a death penalty, I wanted him to die, and I would be there to pull the plug. In 1986, we went to court, and I stood on the witness stand, and I put my hand on the Bible, and I swore that I would tell the truth, and I did. And Ronald Cotton was sentenced to prison for life, and it was the happiest day of my life, because I could put it behind me. And in 1987, we had to retry it. The appellate court overturned the verdict, and we retried the case. And under Vordier, they brought in another gentleman who had supposedly claimed to have been my attacker and was bragging about it in the same prison wing that Ronald Cotton was serving time. I thought this was a huge miscarriage of, miscarriage of justice. I mean, why? And they brought Bobby Poole in front of me, and they said, Ms. Thompson, have you ever seen this man? And I said, I've never seen him in my life. 
have no idea who he is. But do you see the man who raped you in this courtroom today? I said, yes, I do. He's sitting right there. Are you pointing to Ronald Cotton? I said, I'm pointing to Ronald Cotton. And that was it. That's all we needed. And he served until 1995 when DNA became available. And I was asked to take a blood test. Would I submit to it? And I said, sure. And I'll never forget the day I was standing in my kitchen. And the detective and the district attorney came back and told me, Ronald Cotton didn't rape you. It was Bobby Poole, the man I had never seen before in my life. The man who was inches from my face with a knife to my throat. I mean, it was like somebody looked at me saying, you know, you're really not the mother of your children. Eyewitness identification is the number one reason why people are wrongfully convicted. I mean, it's the most fallible evidence that you can have. And what I have come to understand is that my memory was good. But I didn't understand the whole contamination of memory. I didn't understand that whole process. What happened to me was that when I saw him, when I made my mental notes, they were dead on. But when I went to transfer them onto a composite sketch, it was at that moment that I was able to look at a composite sketch that I now had contaminated my memory. And it, the longer this thing goes, that I'm in trial and I see him, um, Ronald Cotton became the man who raped me. And my memory, I mean, it it's, was never going to be erased. That truly, years down the road, you were never going to convince me that Ronald Cotton maybe didn't do it. There was no room for that. Regardless of how good a lawyer you have, it's going to be difficult to shake a person like that. And so you just when you, that's when you need uh, a strong investigator. And that's when you don't need the death penalty. Because if there's any doubt, if there's this much doubt in any of your hearts and in any of your souls, if you think there's this much doubt that Gary Graham didn't do this, and I believe that he didn't. Can any one of you stand there and say, I can pull that plug? There is no DNA that can tell Bernadine Skiller that she was wrong or prove whether she's wrong or not. It's a wonderful gift when we have it, but we don't have it in most cases. We don't have it in this case. We can't have a system that says that the only time we recognize our mistakes is when DNA proves it to us. We have to learn the lessons that DNA teach us about mistakes and certain kinds of evidence. And had there not been DNA in our case, Ronald Cotton would still be in prison right now. Right now. If we know we're making a certain percentage of mistakes, if we know that 2% of the prison population is innocent, are we that stupid to think, well, but none of them are on death row, though? We have to be um, bright enough to know that we have probably put people to death that were innocent. Whatever the percentage is, but one innocent person is way too many innocent people. I couldn't imagine how our system had become so flawed. I couldn't comprehend how the justice system, in which I had so much confidence, could be so fraught with error. It was chilling that we could come almost to the ultimate nightmare. I don't mean to imply that, that the police or the judges or the prosecutors are going out and saying, let's do something unjust, because I don't think that's true. So I'm not, I'm not saying that they, are, that they are bad people. What I'm saying is that, that the system produces bad results. Now, we all know that uh, every trial is not exactly fair. Uh, money buys many things. Money buys the best lawyers. 
one of the principal uh, problems that the ABA saw was with the competency of lawyers who were appointed in these cases. Now there's a reason for this. Uh, first of all, counsel um, are sometimes hard to come by, competent counsel willing to take on these cases. And lawyers who might be perfectly competent to handle a non-capital case uh, and therefore to avoid some of the problems that contribute to wrongful convictions are you know, in over their heads in a capital case uh, and are useless and the problems therefore are exacerbated. Whether to sentence someone to death or to sentence someone to life on the other hand is one of the most subjective sorts of decisions we can ask our fellow human beings to make. And it's, it's particularly crucial at that sentencing stage that counsel for the defendant be up to the job and be strong, able, experienced, uh, just as it is to have a vigorous prosecutor. And most everybody who's convicted uh, and faces the death penalty gets a good lawyer somewhere late down the road in the appeals process. But by that time, uh, all you can do is try to, try to show that something went wrong. A friend of mine who's a lawyer here got into, the, uh, into a death penalty appeals case, came over to talk to me about it, and I said, do you think if you'd been representing him in the trial, he would have been found not guilty? And he said, no. He said, he's guilty. But he said, if I'd been representing him, he wouldn't have gotten the death penalty. Alan was arrested in 1995 for a murder that allegedly took place April the 3rd. The victim's body was discovered 11 days later on April the 14th. These dates are critical because Allen has an airtight alibi from April the 4th through April the 20th. We now know that 17 people told police and prosecutors that they saw the victim, Allen Ray Jenkins, alive after April the 3rd, when he was allegedly to have died. Had my son's defense attorneys been told of the information by police and prosecutors that would have been, they would have been able to prove that Allen is innocent. My son has a right to this information, but the prosecutors did not provide it, even after a court order. In December last year, a judge faulted prosecutors and police for withholding the evidence and overturned Allen's sentence. Now he is awaiting a new trial, and I am certain that Allen will be acquitted. In fact, the evidence that Allen is innocent is so overwhelming that we hope and pray that the charges will be dropped. To the legislators who say our death penalty system works, I ask that you look at what five years on death row has done to my son, to me, and to my family. There, there are many of us who think that juries are imposing the death penalty because they think that life imprisonment doesn't really mean life imprisonment. They, they think life imprisonment means that the defendant will get out of prison at some future time, maybe sooner than they would like to see him get out or her, and the only way they can ensure uh, that this particular defendant does not commit another crime is to sentence them to death. The ABA also was concerned with the independence of the courts in reviewing capital cases once a person had been convicted and sentenced to death. If I had my way, I would establish a 24-month appellate process. And at the end of 24 months, after you've exhausted all the appeals, and every court at every level would have to hear an appeal immediately. There would not be this sitting on a case a year and a half before you hear the appeal. You hear the appeal, rule on it. After 24 months, if the person is appeal is not in their favor, then at the end of that 25th month they would be executed. That was a game that the defense was playing or it was, you know, some type of strategy they were using to throw me off. That's what I thought in 1987. 
Yeah, he heard somebody say somebody else had done it. Well, come on. This is just another ploy. Nobody in prison is guilty. They'll all tell you they're innocent. So I don't think anyone could tell you with confidence that everyone who is convicted of anything in North Carolina was guilty of it. And that's why we have an appeals process, and that's why even years after some people are convicted, uh, evidence arises that sets them free. Our death penalty statute is too all-encompassing. I think jury selection needs to be substantially revised. I think the judges really ought to drive home to the juries that if you sentence this man to life imprisonment without possibility of the parole, that means he will never get out of prison. We've really funded criminal justice and capital work on the cheap, and these are life and death decisions. There will always be an opportunity to present ev evidence of innocence. And certainly better study would be helpful. And then I think you also have to look at the cases uh, of people already on death row uh, and determine whether any of those cases have been plagued by the kinds of problems that you've determined uh, undermine uh, the fairness of the system. Because those are likely to be the cases where there are going to be major problems, including the possibility of innocent people. Have there not been innocent people that have been executed? Oh, I'm sure there have. Do we want to talk about it and face it? I'm sure we don't. If time goes on, this state will probably execute an innocent person. I'd hope that never happens, but it is, and some businesses, they say, that's one of the hazards of doing business. People just say, well, violence, some, bit, some people are going to get killed, some innocent folk are going to get executed, we're doing the best we can. That's not a high enough standard for me. And I'm just not willing to have any innocent people uh, executed. Nor do I think we ought to have a system where some people are executed for crimes that other people get life imprisonment or less for. And that to me is simply not acceptable in terms of the fundamental fairness that we expect of our judicial system. Without question, every single one of the murders for which nearly 160 inmates have been sentenced to die, they're all horrendous. They're all horrendous crimes. And left behind, of course, are the loved ones who will forever have a hole in their heart as a result of the loss. But my review of capital punishment over the past three years is not about how, how bad the nature of the crimes that have been committed. They're all bad. My review is of the mistakes, the mistakes made in the system that put innocent people on death row and nearly put them in the execution chamber. You would have to think that uh, North Carolina is the luckiest state in the union uh, if the problems that plague the death penalty in Maryland and Illinois don't plague the death penalty in North Carolina. I mean, we're just not that different. The extent to which the problems exist may be different, but the same problems because we have basically the same system. We have the same approach. Some of the people who spoke in favor of the resolution were people who supported the death penalty without question. People who favor the death penalty want it to be enforced fairly. Uh, and they don't want innocent people found guilty. I think that's the responsible position for people who support the death penalty to take. On Wednesday morning, January 30th, <coughs> 1985, my eight-year-old daughter Jean left home to walk to school four blocks away. She was found later that morning, several miles from home, molested, murdered, hung from a low limb. When I learn about innocent people on death row, I wonder what went wrong in those cases. I don't believe anybody set out to execute an innocent individual. I keep thinking there must be some small mistake that somehow got compounded in the process and led to a potentially tragic result. What could be wrong with delaying further executions until we find out how the mistakes happen? and what we can do to restore justice to the system. I think the absolute worst thing that could happen for a victim 
uh, would be for the state to carry out an execution in that person's name and it turned out that the person executed was innocent. I think that our first obligation to a victim is to get the right person and to prosecute that person uh, in a trial that is fair. I think that's our obligation to the victim. I think that's our obligation to each other. And I think that the system that we have now is so broken that we can't even give that assurance. And the question is going to be whether the public officials who are responsible for administering the death penalty in North Carolina are going to step up to their obligation to actually lead on this issue and to be able to assure the public uh, that the system uh, is, is, is fair and, and therefore that they are safe. And I think the governor and the attorney general have to do the same thing with the death penalty. They support it and so their obligation now is to assure the public that it's fair uh, and that it is being carried out in a way uh, that ensures that the people who are convicted and sentenced to death in fact are the people who are guilty of the crime. And we should be leading the world on issues like this. And we're bringing up the rear. <laughs>